Welcome to Curator with a Camera. I'm Bob Gwynn and I'm going to talk you through the Shinkansen. This is the Japanese bullet train Shinkansen Series Zero. They originally came out in 1964. Arguably, it's the most important train since Rocket. This is the one that proved to people the passenger railway had a future. And when it came out in 1964, it was the fastest train in the world. It was the first one to have fully in-cab signalling and it was on its own dedicated line. Its nickname is the Bullet Train. It looks like a bullet and it went straight as a die through the countryside at high speed. So calling it a bullet was a sensible thing to do, really. And compared with trains of its day, it, it was way ahead of the look and speed of trains. It cut the journey time between um, Tokyo and Osaka by about a half as the train rocketed through the countryside. Hence, you end up with that iconic image of it running past Mount Fuji, um, very much as a symbol of a modern Japan, stepping away from all the, the, the troubles and strife of the 1940s. And at that point onwards, it just took off as an idea. People's attitudes to passenger railways were changed. And today, the Shinkansen has completely transformed people's view of transport all over the world. This Shinkansen, it was actually built in 1976 and it was presented to the museum and it came here in 2001 from West Japan Railways. Now when you look at it, you realise that they look very like a plane of that period. The nose at the front there very much looks like a Boeing of its day. Um, look at the, the side cab windows, that, that could easily be the side of a plane. And that, of course, is for two reasons. One, it's very deliberate. The Japanese realized that they wanted to empty the regional airlines around Japan. And that's why they were investing in a new high-speed line. And the second is some of the engineers who worked on this had actually worked in the aero industry, both before and, uh, and during the, the Second World War. And that's quite deliberate because you're actually saying to people, you don't need to get a plane, you can get a train. As you move along the side of it, you'll see that it is uh, very streamlined, quite deliberately, because it's going to run at very high speed. Um, it was air conditioned. Uh, it's got triple glazing. And when you get to the far end of it, you'll realize that the, the pantograph, the thing that takes the electricity, 25 kV AC, um, from the overhead power lines. They've also got a fairing around them that helps with the aerodynamics. And later they looked into how the pantograph was and, and made those um, more streamlined as well. And in Japan, of course, at the time when this was being built, their network was three foot six inch gauge network, what we used to call Cape gauge over here. And they decided, no, the way forward was for standard gauge and they'd build their new line, standard gauge, four foot eight and a half. The Shinkansen, of course, is replacing a, a, an ordinary main line that went from Tokyo uh, down to Kyoto and into Osaka uh, on the three foot six inch gauge, which actually had over a thousand level crossings. So their decision to go for a brand new line, which had no level crossings, it, uh, most of it is either in tunnel or, or on viaduct, it meant that there was no conflict at all either with any of the other transport users as the, as the train rocketed through the countryside. So it was radical in that way as well. Looking underneath here, here's the bogey of the Shinkansen, which was pretty much as good as you could get at the time. The engineer responsible for this was a fellow called Tadashi Matsudaira. And Matsudaira was somebody who'd worked on the uh, vibration on the Japanese Zero uh, planes. 
and he'd got it as far as you could get it at that time uh, correct and it really helped make sure that you had a very safe very comfortable very fast service so he's another one of the stars of the Shinkansen story. The other thing about the Shinkansen is of course all wheels are powered so all of those wheels have got a little motor on them it's not a little motor it's 250 horsepower which means smooth acceleration very quick acceleration it means you can brake more easily it was well ahead of what other people were doing at that time on an ordinary passenger service. So that's the exterior of the train. Now we'll go inside uh, the passenger part of the train and then, great privilege, we're then going to go inside the cab of the Shinkansen. Now as we go into the carriage, what you'll notice is it's actually wider and longer than you're used to in the UK. And it's slightly higher too. And it's designed around comfort and convenience and um, each of the uh, seats, of course, also has um, the ability to put your bento box, which is the Japanese um, uh, food box, because uh, eating was allowed on Shinkansen. In fact, bento box is a part of the the special nature of being on a Shinkansen. You can have this um, Japanese cuisine as you uh, shoot along. As you go down the train, you realize fairly standard luggage racks, uh, no more than you would expect, really. All the uh, uh, seats are all uh, marked, because uh, of course it's a, it's a reserved train. You've got to have a reservation, you've got to be on it uh, in the right place. Inevitably, there's, there's a little netting for um, putting things in. Um, and then when you come to the end of it, uh, you come through to where the uh, driver sits. And that's what we're going to see next. And here we go into the uh, Shinkansen. And as you can see, it's a big, wide cab. Driver sits over there. There's a spare seat on this side here. And it's got a great view forward uh, and it's got all the controls that need to be switched on here we come over to the main part that you'd be interested in i think which is the driver's seat and you sit in the driver's seat because it's the simplest place to sit and what have we got here well we've got his brake on this side the brake handle uh, tells us how much uh, air brake he's got and then he's got um, the accelerator a couple of other things he's got. He's got a place to put his stopwatch. These trains are notoriously um, accurate on terms of their timing. They've got a phone through to the control. This is um, a system whereby there's no line side signaling. You're not looking out at signaling. All your signals are, are, are delivered electronically to the cab of the locomotive, to the cab of the train. Uh, and if there's a problem, you can phone Tokyo Control with this, or the other end of the line, actually, as well. Directly in front is the speedometer. And the speedometer, don't forget, this is, uh, has an outside electronic control, so the driver is, is appraised of what the speed he should be doing. If for some reason he exceeds that, uh, then the speed is automatically adjusted back to what it should be. You can see it goes right across the 260 kilometers per hour and generally the drivers are fantastically accurate in terms of their arrival time. What else can we see here? Well, there are buttons that are important to him. There's a pantograph down button here. There's windscreen wipers and the washer button as well uh, and, and the volts. The, the amount of power has been drawn into the, into the machine and in fact the only old-fashioned thing on here, really, is the bell down here. There is a bell. I imagine it's a warning bell, should you exceed uh, the speed you're supposed to be doing. The other thing to say about Japan is, of course, it's a, it's a country that has a lot of typhoons, a lot of earthquakes, which is a bit of a problem if you're on a train going at high speed. So the one thing this thing has, which is really a bit of a surprise, it has a, uh, a button here which is... Um, to basically um, 
isolate all electrics in the train in case of earthquake. Uh, in actual fact, um, there are earthquake sensors, very sophisticated ones, all around and keyed into the main control system so that it's unlikely they'd ever need to use that. But just in case, it's fitted with one. Remember the, the safety uh, record of the Shinkansen is second to none in the world. The other thing to say about this is you can actually, um, of course, get into the nose cone because in maintenance people need to get into the nose to, um, to deal with the lights and things like that. The floor comes up like that. Just make sure you lock it down so you don't bump your fingers. Little door and then in we go. And here we go. And you can see, well, I mean to say, as you might imagine, lots of electrical switch gear. Um, but really quite a large space with, with very little in it, apart from, of course, here are the lights uh, and there's the view out, which is from the lights, which is something you wouldn't normally see at all. Um, quite a big space, but really only here to enable the streamlining of the train. And there we are. We hope you enjoyed the Shinkansen. It's a very interesting train, but most importantly, it was revolutionary. It was one of those trains that really broke the mould and made people sit up and take notice as to what was the possible future of the railway. A future that actually is really important to today's world. It was a game changer. If you've enjoyed this, do watch some more Curators with a Camera. There's plenty more episodes coming soon and, and leave a like and uh, subscribe. That would be really great. Thank you.